right, Mako. Get ready, this is for real. Hey there, I'm Mark Ellis, and welcome to an all new episode of RT Essentials. If you're anything like me, you just can't get enough of sci-fi, the time travel, the robots, the spacecrafts, the time traveling robots riding in spacecrafts like Robot in Lost in Space. Really, they named the robot, it's just called Robot. Lazy in space, more like it. I digress. The point is, we love science fiction, and nothing pairs better with science-based cinema than some grade A action. These scenes don't take no crap off nobody. They're out there, they can't be bargained with, and they don't feel pity or remorse or fear. They've come here to kick butt and chew popcorn. And they're all out of popcorn. But hopefully you're not. So go ahead and get those kernels popping, scoot forward to the edge of your seat, and throw on your favorite tinfoil hats. These are the most badass sci-fi action scenes ever. The Truck Chase, Terminator 2. Up first is the truck chase scene from James Cameron's classic Terminator 2 Judgment Day. In T2, John Connor is the target of a shape-shifting T-1000. You know, the liquid metal guy? But luckily, he's got another Terminator on his team, the revamped T-800 that looks remarkably like Arnold Schwarzenegger. Unlike his character in the first Terminator, Arnold's T-800 is actually a good guy in this film, sent from the future to protect Connor. Which brings us to a chase in which Connor flees from the T-1000 on a small motorcycle, and the T-1000 steals a semi-truck, drives it off a bridge, and chases Connor through the concrete flood channels of Los Angeles. The T-1000 is relentless, but the Governator catches up on his motorcycle, rescues Connor just seconds before the T-1000 crashes his truck into an overpass, and it explodes. Because a massive explosion was really the only way to end such an iconic action scene. Cameron utilized massive set pieces, pyrotechnics, lots of cables, and the latest CGI available to achieve this sequence. For the shot where Arnold's bike flies off a ledge, soars through the air, and crashes down on the concrete, large cranes were placed on the opposite sides of the jump with a wire running between them and the motorcycle attached to that wire so it could swing in the air and land without serious damage. The wires were then removed in post, which makes this shot look incredibly realistic. practical approach was also used for when the semi-truck smashes through a wall, then leaps off the high-rise freeway and lands in the canal below. A large fake wall was built, which also concealed a ramp that the vehicle required to gain enough elevation to make the jump. Of course, when the T-1000 rises from the explosion in his liquid metal form, that's not an actor, Cameron had to rely on CGI, but that's part of what makes and still makes this one of the greatest sci-fi action films of all time. It perfectly represents the transition from practical effects to CGI in cinema. It's no wonder Judgment Day took home the Oscar for Best Visual Effects at the 64th Annual Academy Awards. Now, I don't think it gets more badass than a cyborg Schwarzenegger riding a Harley Davidson fat boy wearing head-to-toe leather and holding a sawed-off shotgun, but the night is young, my friends, so let's not get ahead of ourselves. The Lobby Fight, The Matrix. already almost did it. I spoke too soon because the lobby fight from The Matrix might just be the most badass sci-fi action scene to ever hit the big screen. I'm sure you're familiar with Neo and Trinity and their rebellion against the intelligent machines that have created The Matrix to distract humans from their reality. I'm sure you're also familiar with the groundbreaking bullet time VFX that's become synonymous with The Matrix franchise. But did you know that the lobby shootout scene was mostly achieved using practical methods? Neo and Trinity enter the building carrying an overwhelming number of firearms, and naturally, they're swarmed by guards. What ensues is one of the most jaw-dropping, wall-flipping, guns-blazing, debris-flying, face-kicking fights you've ever seen, outside or inside the Matrix. 
One shot in particular features Neo doing a cartwheel over an M16 rifle, picking it up with one hand, and then immediately shooting a group of guards while still cartwheeling. It's insane! And get this, just the setup for this shot took almost a day to reset, with the special effects team having to reload the roughly 4,000 squibs in the walls. Which means that Keanu Reeves and his stuntman, Chad Stahelski, were under immense pressure to pull off these moves in as few takes as possible. The two practiced cartwheeling with their eyes closed, knowing that they wouldn't be able to see much of the action once the explosions went off. Magically, Reeves and Stahelski managed to pull off many of these stunts in one take. But still, Stahelski sustained several injuries during the making of The Matrix, including broken ribs and a dislocated shoulder, so we don't go thinking these were just some bendy spoon-fed actors that we're watching here. Again, these are badasses. Once again wearing head-to-toe leather, I'm seeing a trend here. The Outpost 29 battle, Starship Troopers. Place crawl, sir. We need pickup now. What's your position? Come down on this transmission. Inside the outpost? That's crazy. Well, I hope you have a crazy pilot. Out. <laughs> Okay, so the Outpost 29 battle from Starship Troopers doesn't feature any head-to-toe weather, but it does have an army of arachnids, aka an insectoid alien race that has evolved to colonize planets with the use of advanced technology. And anything involving aliens gets the immediate badass stamp of approval. These are just the rules, folks. I don't make them, I'm simply a notary. The most repulsive creatures in the arachnid army are the four-legged warrior bugs, who can camouflage with their environment and reproduce in much larger numbers than other arachnids. Their role in the army is similar to that of the orcs in Lord of the Rings. They're the grunts of the operation, the ones you send to battle in high numbers knowing they'll take the initial brunt of the opposing force. And that's exactly what happens at Outpost 29 on Planet P when the Federation falls into a trap, gets swarmed by warrior bugs, and the arachnid army finally breaches the perimeter. Let's take a moment to remember that this film was released in 1997, and somehow the special effects, specifically our warrior bugs, still hold up. I'd even go a step further and say that they're on par with the visual effects you'd see in big budget films from the last five years. That's because, much like Jurassic Park, Starship Troopers use prosthetics, miniatures, models, and other practical methods in conjunction with CGI instead of relying on CGI alone. This hybrid method is one of the main reasons the aliens in this film make for such menacing antagonists they were believable. But as you can imagine, this wasn't a cheap approach, and Starship Troopers ended up costing over $105 million to make. But it was nominated for Best Visual Effects at the 70th Academy Awards, and it's safe to say that the outpost battle had a lot to do with that. Optimus Prime vs. Bone Crusher Transformers Megatron Prime! What would a list of badass sci-fi action scenes be without some serious bayhem? Well, I wouldn't know. Michael Bay is one of the most influential action directors of all time, and even James Cameron has famously admitted to studying and taking influence from Bay's shooting style, so obviously we can't leave him out here. And in the Optimus Prime vs. Bone Crusher scene from the first Transformers, well that's just peak Bay hem. The fate of humanity is at stake thanks to two races of robots bringing their war to Earth which I guess, thank you, like we don't have enough problems here already. I'm paying almost $7 in gas just to get down the road and now I have to worry about a car in front of me morphing into a giant robot and destroying everything in sight? Sorry, I ranted there and I blacked out. 
Oh yeah, the world faces total destruction, but Optimus Prime is actually a good robot. He's part of the heroic Autobots who want to rebuild their home planet Cybertron and end the war. Bone Crusher, on the other hand, well, his name is Bone Crusher. He's part of the villainous Decepticons, and they want to utilize Earth's machines to build a giant army. Again, his name is Bone Crusher, so it's kind of obvious he might not be a team player. Prime and Bone Crusher face off on a busy freeway, skating through traffic, exchanging blows, and eventually tackling each other off of a bridge. Prime unsheaths his energy sword and more or less decapitates Bone Crusher, who may or may not survive. I'm not giving you a spoiler here. Go watch the movie. <laughs> Yes, this scene is as epic as it gets, but it almost wasn't to be because Michael Bay originally dismissed Transformers as a, quote, stupid toy movie when he was approached to direct. But once he visited Hasbro, he started to understand and respect the concept and eventually came around. Also, he wanted to work with Steven Spielberg, who is an executive producer, because it's Steven Spielberg. What are you going to tell the guy no? Old Painless is waiting, Predator. Is waiting. The old Painless is waiting sequence from Predator could hold the record for the most ammunition fired with the least amount of damage done. Okay, that might not be entirely true. There's some serious damage done to those tree branches and the other rainforest vegetation, but I don't think that was the goal. The real target was the jungle hunter, aka Predator, aka the demon who makes trophies of men and aliens. In this particular sequence, Blaine Cooper, played by Jesse, the body Ventura, is carrying his minigun, which he has dubbed Old Painless, waiting eagerly for Predator, or really whoever, to appear so he can blast them to pieces. Unfortunately, Predator strikes first, shooting Blaine with his plasma caster through the chest and killing him on impact. This is when Blaine's friend Mac rushes over and begins firing at the creature, slightly wounding it, and then picks up Old Painless and continues to blindly fire, while the rest of the soldiers also joining in the fruitless shootout, including Arnold Schwarzenegger's character Dutch, don't have a lot of luck. We got Ventura, we got the Governor. How many political figures does it take to kill a jungle creature? Clearly more than two. Predator proved to be an effective sci-fi horror flick with plenty of action and one of the most terrifying and original monsters of any film to date. Considering this was screenwriting brothers Jim and John Thomas' first real script and director John McTiernan's second film ever, this was an impressive achievement, especially since it featured an ensemble cast and shot entirely on location in various jungles throughout Mexico. The old painless sequence featured tons of fake leaves to give an extra lush rainforest vibe, and that little bit of green predator goo was actually from the inside of a glow stick. And this film still received an Oscar nomination for best visual effects. See, you don't need all that fancy CGI, just get some glow sticks, some leaves, some shredded politicos, and you got yourself a picture. Get away from her, you beep! Alien. Get away from her, you If you thought Lieutenant Ripley had already reached peak badass potential in the first Alien, then you were sorely mistaken because the sequel Aliens features Ripley at the helm of a power loader exosuit, hand-to-hand -hand fighting a xenomorph alien queen, and delivering one of the most quotable lines in movie history. Get away from her, you! Well, it's a family show, but you can fill in the rest. Special effects legend Stan Winston, who also worked on Terminator and Predator, had his crew develop a method in which there would be another person inside the power loader assisting Sigourney Weaver. That person was stuntman John Leaves. The tandem exosuit was a full-scale prop made with aluminum, fiberglass, and PVC plastic and weighing roughly 600 pounds. 
Weez would control the suit from within, while Weaver was positioned in the operator's seat. And for some of the wide shots, a scale miniature was built, with puppeteers controlling the machine's movement and a small doll of Ripley inside. Aliens is packed with iconic scenes like this one, and Weaver's performance earned her an Oscar nomination for Best Actress, which was somewhat of a shock considering that science fiction, the entire genre, had been previously overlooked by the Academy. Though Weaver lost to Marley Matlin, who had won for the drama Children of a Lesser God, Aliens did end up taking home the Oscar for Best Visual Effects. I'm seeing a trend with these movies here. One of four Academy Awards the late Stan Winston would receive in his wonderful career. Training complete, Edge of Tomorrow. I found the Omega. I found it. it has to be here. Turn her down, Germany. This has got to be it. It fits the description perfectly. Yes, you found it. Again. What difference does it make? Because we're never going to get there. No matter what we do, no matter how carefully we plan, we can't get off that beach. Next up is Training Complete from Edge of Tomorrow, lived I repeat, directed by Doug Lyman. The film was adapted from the 2004 Japanese light novel All You Need Is Kill and tells the story of Major William Cage, played by Tom Cruise, who is forced to join a landing operation against an invading alien race. Cage gets thrown into a time loop in which he relives the same brutal fight over and over and over again, including his death. But with each encore, his fighting skills improve, and he and his comrade Sergeant Rita Vrataski, played by Emily Blunt, come even closer to defeating the alien. Okay, so we got Tom Cruise, we got Emily Blunt, and Aliens. I mean, you got my money already, but now you're tossing in time loops? That's a whole new dimension, literally. Cruise's character Cage is exposed to an Alpha's blood. Alphas are the commanding unit of the Mimic Alien Invasion Force, and this exposure allows Cage to hijack the alien's ability to reset time. So now Cage and Brataski can time loop and get sufficient training in to excel in combat, which is how the two end up at this most climactic moment. Brataski assures Cage that he can do this. If he keeps showing up, she will train him. And that's when Cage tells Brataski she already has. And boom, we're thrown right into the battle. You can do this. You can. You keep coming here every day and I'll train you. You already have. Since Aliens has us on an exoskeleton appreciation kick, let's take a closer look at the insane battlesuits Blunt and Cruz are sporting. The production design team handcrafted dozens of these suits over the course of five months, some weighing anywhere from 85 pounds up to 130 pounds depending on their functions. Blunt trained for three months for the role, knowing that she'd be performing most of her own stunts wearing one of these heavy metal suits, which required the assistance of four people and took upwards of 30 minutes just to put on. Have we mentioned yet that Emily Blunt is a total badass? He's a sense offender, equilibrium. Clara, what's happening? We heard gunshots. Go! What are you doing? Clara, the resistance fighter. Clara! He's a sense offender! He's a sense offender is a scene from the dystopian drama Equilibrium, in which Christian Bale's character, John Preston, joins the resistance and beats the heck out of a bunch of armed agents. He clearly doesn't like being called a sense offender, as is evidenced by what he does to the guard who accuses him of being such. But if you're familiar with the plot, then you'll understand that being a sense offender is the worst thing that you can be in this futuristic totalitarian state. The leaders of this new world blame human emotions as the cause of World War III, so any activity or object that stimulates human emotion is strictly forbidden and punishable by death. But clearly, we're emotional beings, so the population is forced to take a daily injection of prosium-2 to suppress those emotions. Preston is a high-ranking cleric, uncompromising, and ambitiously carrying out his orders to keep the population under control and emotion-free. But after accidentally missing a dose of prosium, he begins to experience emotional episodes and finds himself conflicted with his role in society. Preston continues to avoid his medication, 
one thing leads to another, and he eventually aids the revolution in overthrowing the regime. Culminating in this epic action sequence, it was not only clearly inspired by The Matrix, but also features some of the best gun kata you're ever going to see. Director Kurt Wimmer depicts the firearm as an extension of the user, like a sword to a samurai, and the law enforcement agents in his film are masters of this fictional martial art, which helps them in enforcing sense crimes. But as you can see, in Equilibrium, Bale is basically the Bruce Lee of gun kata, aka gun fu, aka do not mess with that guy. The Exosuit District 9. Under fire! Under fire! Keep your positions! It's for the man. Hey, Dickus! Did you really think we weren't gonna squeeze in some more Exosuit appreciation before this episode was over? Then do you know me at all? How could we not include the exosuit scene from the 2009 sci-fi thriller District 9? This time, instead of utilizing the biosuit to fight against extraterrestrials, like in Aliens and Edge of Tomorrow, the protagonist here, Wickes Vandermeer, uses the suit to fight off human mercenaries and rescue an alien named Christopher. Yes, the alien is named Christopher, which is still better than naming your robot, Robot. Director Neil Blomkamp was already an established special effects artist and 3D animator, and when Peter Jackson saw Blomkamp's reel, he was so impressed that he decided to produce District 9, which was an adaptation of Blomkamp's short, Alive in Jober. Well, Blomkamp was really supposed to direct a film adaptation of Halo with Jackson producing, but that fell through, so they decided to make District 9 instead. The point is, this was actually Blomkamp's first feature-length film, which is pretty astounding considering it was nominated for four Oscars, including Best Picture and, where is it, Best Visual Effects, the latter of which should not be surprising to anybody. Thank the Embassy FX Studios based out of Vancouver for rendering this exosuit sequence using the industry standard software Autodesk and Mental Ray and additional plugins from Safa. All the aliens in this film are CGI, except the ones that appear on the operating table in the medical lab, which makes this film even more impressive considering how expensive top notch computer graphics can be, and the film's entire budget was only $30 million. And still, the alien is named Christopher. Gypsy Danger vs. Leatherback, Pacific Rim. And last but certainly not least is Gypsy Danger vs. Leatherback from the 2013 monster film Pacific Rim, directed by Guillermo del Toro. I am well aware that a scene featuring a giant monster fighting a giant exoskeleton doesn't require any real context, and it's just objectively awesome. And as we've already learned, exosuit equals badass. So yeah, this scene slaps, but for those who were curious, that monster Leatherback is part of a legion known as the Kaiju, who arose from the sea and brought with them an all-consuming thirst for war. As a result, mankind was forced to develop massive robots called Jaegers, which humans could pilot via a neural bridge. Gypsy Danger was one of the oldest Jaegers in active combat, considered obsolete. But, spoiler alert, when all other Jaegers had failed, it was Gypsy that came to the rescue and laid the smack down on Leatherback. Empty the cliff! Empty the cliff! Del Toro hired Oscar-winning artists from Industrial Light and Magic to create the film's visual effects, and additionally featured miniature effect shots provided by 3210 Studios. 
The acclaimed director took inspiration from the woodblock print, the Great Wave off Kanagawa for the film's ocean battles, and for battles in general, like this one, he was influenced by Francisco Goya's painting The Colossus and wanted to evoke the same sense of awe in these shots as you get from Goya's work. And there you have it, our selections for the most badass sci-fi action scenes. As always, we couldn't include every sequence that fits the bill, but we got plenty more episodes of RT Essentials coming your way, so I'm sure we'll get there eventually. Thanks for watching, I'm Mark Ellis, and no, this is not an exosuit.